the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Calling all cars, attention all cars to broadcast 259 regarding a train robbery. Be on the lookout for the following described suspect. Male American, six foot, one inch tall, brown eyes, brown hair. This man held up the Union Pacific train at Rawlings, Wyoming, this state. That is all, Harmon. Some of the older generation may mourn the passing of the time-honored Cracker Barrel. It was virtually a social institution, patronized by those who dropped into the little corner store to trade, chew the fat, and the grocer's crackers. The fact that the lid was always open was hospitable enough, but we must admit it didn't make for the cleanest, freshest crackers in the world. Nowadays, I doubt if you could buy crackers in the bulk, and you wouldn't want them if you could. They would be dirty. Well, Dr. Lindsley, has Rio Grande gone into the cracker business? No, Mr. Kroger, but Rio Grande is in the oil business. And like the modern grocer, we are determined to keep our products clean, free from flying dust and sand. That is why you can't buy real lube, motor oil in bulk. That is why every quart of this great 100% paraffin-based lubricant is tightly sealed in tamper-proof cans before it leaves the refinery for its trip to the crankcase of your car. Dust and dirt can't get in. None of Real Lube's unadulterated strength can get out. There's no chance of substitution, dilution, or spilling. When you drop around in the morning for that tank full of widely acclaimed police car performance Rio Grande cracks and gasoline, take on a crankcase full of Real Lube, the cold-proof, Speed-proof motor oil that comes in grit-proof cans. The story we are to hear tonight has been told by the man who enacted the major role in the events presented as our case. We have therefore asked William L. Carlyle to prepare a foreword for our program. We present Bill Carlyle, the leading character in tonight's drama. I have decided to tell, for the first time on the air, my story in all its cold reality. I have one single object in hearing broadcast tonight the details of my pan- bandit days. That object is to curb forever the glamour that is attached to me. I want the world, and especially the footloose use of the world, to know that even the most colorful, the most daring of the so-called Robin Hood bandits will ultimately pay a terrible price in years of aging mind-destroying confinement for the brief moment of excitement and the few easy dollars gained. I looked back on the 20 years of imprisonment, restriction of paying day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, for the debt I incurred when I swung aboard my first train, gun in hand, and committed my first crime, and say to you, it was a terrible price to pay. As our story unfolds, you will see why I can so strongly say crime is a losing proposition. Outside the office of the Denver Post on a cold, blustering day in February 1916, a man stood reading bulletins, telling of the progress of a war in Europe. Cold, numb fingers clutched as he turned up coat collar. Looks like we're going to get into this crap, don't it? Yeah, it looks that way. I don't see no sense in mixing in other people's messes. Neither do I, but if that's the way they want it, well, that's the way it's got to be. Mm. Well, I ain't going to fight in some foreign country. Say, that's a nice-looking toy gun you got there. Where'd you get it? Well, yeah, give them to you inside there if you put an ad in the post. Oh, is that so? Yeah, they got a lot of toys in there. I got this glass gun for my kid. He'll get a kick out of it. Yeah, I bet he will. I'd like to have one for a niece back east. Why don't you go in and get one? Oh, I, I haven't got anything to advertise. How about selling me yours? Mm-hmm. I don't know. What'd it cost you? 25 cents. Yeah, I guess you can have it. Oh, thanks. Here's a quarter. <laughs> Don't make yourself sick on the candy in the handle there. Candy? Yeah, the handle's full of candy. Don't expect it's too much good, though. Candy. <laughs> Wonder what he'd say if he knew I've only got a nickel between me and starvation. Anyway, I got a ticket to Cheyenne. I might as well mosey along. <laughs> On the train to Cheyenne, Bill Carlyle tapped the store of sweets and the handle of the toy gun. He found Cheyenne in the harsh and deadly grip of winter. Work was non-existent. Across the sagebrush plains of Wyoming, Carlyle tramped from camp to camp, 
from ranch to ranch, seeking work. Howdy, stranger. Come in, get warm. Thanks. I don't mind if I do. It's sort of hard on your feet tramping over the frozen ground out there. Sure is. My name's Barrett. Dad owns this place, and we boys take turns staying out here at the camp. I'm Bill Carlisle. I just got in from the foothills. Trying to find something to do. Don't know if anybody needs a hand, do you? Nope, afraid not. Things are pretty tight right now. I'm heading for Green River. Hope I can get work on the railroad doing something. You won't get far working for the U.P. Well, a job is a job, whether it's for the U.P. or on a ranch. Well, luck to you. But if I was you, I'd just take it easy a few days and rest up. You look like you've been striking it sort of tough lately. I have. Nope. Now I guess I'll mosey on toward Green River. Maybe I'll grab a freight east or maybe work over toward the coast. Yeah, if you change your mind, you can come back and put up here for a while. Strangers are always welcome. Well, thanks, partner. Maybe I'll take you up on that someday. Hey, oh. that's a funny gun you got there. Oh, that, that ain't no gun, really. Just a glass toy I bought off a fella in Denver. I was going to send it to a niece of mine back east, but I just never got around to doing it. <laughs> well, I'll be doggone. I never saw a glass gun before. <laughs> Reckon it wouldn't be much help in a pinch, though. <laughs> no, not much. Well, I'll be mosey, and I'll see you again sometime. The blizzard increased in force as Carlisle made his way toward the little town of Green River. The howling wind whipped the flying snow into a ghostly cloud about him as he trudged toward the town. Night closed in smotheringly as he entered the warm glow of the railway station waiting room. Howdy. Howdy. Live around here? No. Looks like it uh, might clear a mind, eh? Yes, it does. Live west of here? No, been working mines around Denver. Oh. Seen the post today? No, thank you. Like one of these here magazines? No, thank you. Got some good Wild West stories in them. Have they? Yeah. All about the bold, bad bandits of the Old West. Bandits, huh? Yeah. Yeah, them was the days. You remember them? Remember them? Well, say I do. I was in the posse that hung one of them. That hung a bandit? Sure thing. They was a hard-riding, fast-shooting lot. Yeah. I used to read about them when I was a kid. Well, them days is gone forever, I reckon. We ain't had a train robbing these parts in nigh under 20 years, yeah. What'd you say? Oh, nothing. I was just sort of thinking out loud. It sounded just like I said it'd uh, be easy to hold up a train. <laughs> did it? Yeah, sure did. Couldn't be so easy, though. Fella'd get caught sure shooting. What makes you think so? Well, last time the U.P. got held up, they offered a big reward and some rancher turned the fella in. Was that the one they hung? Well, the same fella. Young guy, too. Looked a lot like you, as a matter of fact. Rancher turned him in, huh? Yeah. The reward was more than the place was worth for farming, so he figured it was a good deal. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, it was a good deal for the rancher. Yes, sir. Posse's out here always get the bandage up. Well, there's my train. Going back to Iowa to see my daughter. So long, young fella. Don't hold up no train. Never can tell. <laughs> they might hang you. Yeah, they might have that. Don't hold up no train. Why not? darted toward the rear platform, and as the train gained speed, the silhouette of a man was outlined against the lighted door. Holding a white handkerchief, the man formed a mask across his face and, stamping the snow from his feet, entered the car. Hey, you. Me, boy? Yeah, you. Take off your cap and walk down the aisle ahead of me. Uh, yeah, the shoe, uh, baggage, sir. Don't get funny. Move. Oh, my, oh, my, move. Yes, I'll All right, move. get your mitts up, all of you. Cut out the chatter. 
Yeah. Get your money in this bird's cap. Oh, my. Oh, my. Lord. Okay, mister, just drop your wallet in. That's it. Please don't take my ring. It's my wedding ring. Keep it, lady. I never rob no women. Oh, thank you. Get going, Porter. Oh, my God. I'm moving. I'm going. It's a nice watch chain you got there, mister. Anything on the end of it? Yeah, pretty watch. I'll keep it. Oh, but Never mind. Just keep your mouth shut. And that goes for the rest of you. Move on, Porter. Uh, yes, I'll move on. Oh, my Lord. Oh, what happened? Oh, what's wrong? We stopped it. Don't worry, lady. Nobody's going to get hurt. I'm getting off. Open that door, Porter. Oh, yeah, sir, yeah, sir. Uh, there's the conductor, sir, in the vestibule. I see him. Hey, you, get that trap door open. I said open it up. Open it up, boss. Let's get him off here. He's bad, boss. Say, you're going to be mighty cold out there, white man. Don't worry about me. Get started. <laughs> For those, he had forfeited his right to walk uprightly as a man. As dawn broke over the Wyoming hills, he reached the sheep camp he had left the night before. Why, howdy, Carlisle. Come on in. Uh, thanks, Barrett. Thought you were going east. Well, I was, but I, I got snowbound and I couldn't make it. Thought I'd take you up on that offer to lay up here for a few days. That's all right with me. Make yourself at home. Thanks. I got to go into town this morning and may not get back before night. But you'll find everything you need around here someplace. Oh, you'll find a six-shooter in that box back of the stove. Six-shooter? What'll I need that for? Oh, sometimes we like to shoot a few rabbits. Sort of breaks up the monotony. Oh, Good eating, too. Yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe I will go hunting. Well, better get some breakfast, I guess. I'm going to have to pull out pretty soon. Say, this is a pretty nice-looking gun. Want to sell it? Maybe. What do you want for it? Oh, I don't know. It belongs to Pedro. He'll be in after a while to get some coffee. Offer him five or six bucks for it if you want to. He'll take it. Okay, I'll talk to him. With six of his stolen dollars, Carlisle bought the gun from Pedro and with it in his belt made his way back to Green River. Two days had passed since he had held up the Oregon Limited. Concealing his Mackinac in an alley, he made his way toward the town's one barbershop. Hey, is it too late to get a shave and a haircut? Nope, if you want to wait. Okay. You'll find a paper over there, help yourself. Oh, thanks. A lot of stuff in there about the train robber. Hear about it? Yeah, a little. He yeah, must be a mighty cool fellow from what I hear. That so? Yep. Got a big gang with him, too. Well, how'd they find that out? Oh, some guy saw a big bunch with him. Seems like they all get on top of the cars, and this fellow holds up the passengers. <laughs> That's a good trick if you can get away with it. Yeah. Thing I like about him, though, is the way he treats women. Won't molest them, no how. Hey, boys. Need you fellas for a posse. What's up, Marshal? Well, we got the train robber. Huh? Yeah? Where is he? He's a 